Hi, everybody, and welcome to our Leash Reactivity webinar. Um, my name is uh, Krishma War. I'll introduce myself a little bit in a moment. Um, I'm coming, you, coming to you guys as Head of Training and Behavior at Calm Canine Academy in conjunction with Muddy Paws Rescue to talk about understanding and treatment for leash reactive dogs, both fosters and adopted dogs. Um, I'm very excited to chat about this topic. We've got tons of questions from the community and hopefully today we'll get a nice overview um, into uh, understanding this behavior condition, the contributing factors and how we should be going about treatment. So uh, I'm gonna get underway. I'm gonna introduce myself first and then we will jump straight in. So I know I see a lot of uh, friendly faces um, in the group today. Um, my name is Karishma. Um, like I said, Head of Training and Behavior at Calm Canine Academy. Um, we are, I, I personally have a lot of different certifications. I'm a bit of a nerd that way, but most importantly for this topic, I am a certified professional dog trainer um, and I specialize in aggression and complex behavior concerns in the urban environment. Um, and I've been working in New York City, London and other major cities around the world for the last seven years now. Wow, that's longer getting longer every year. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about um, Calm Canine Academy. Um, we are a small group of elite dog, trainer, dog trainers and behavior specialists. Um, as you can see, we are extremely nerdy and are constantly looking for the best and most up-to-date scientific and ethical practices to help dogs and their guardians in predominantly urban environments with complex behavior concerns. Um, we operate entirely digitally. Um, it's an incredibly effective format to handle aggression and um, reactivity as well as other behavior concerns. And you can check us out. Uh, there'll be some links um, in this PowerPoint. Everything will be available to you guys and sent your way after the webinar is over. If anyone is watching the recording and is interested in the PDF, it should be linked in the comments section. So you should be able to download these slides and uh, get all of the links and information from them. Okay, I'm going to put my camera off for the rest of the webinar and just let you guys focus on the material. Um, if, uh, like I mentioned before, any questions, do put them in the chat box. Um, I might try and address some, but probably we'll just send out answers later on uh, next week. So I wanna jump straight in um, to this uh, very in complex topic uh, uh, by discussing what leash reactivity is. Um, so we're gonna define it a little bit. We're then gonna go over some common mistakes that people make when working with leash reactivity before talking about the treatment plan. Um, so those are the three sort of main topics that we're gonna go over today. I think I should start off by saying that um, by no means is uh, this webinar a sufficient education in this area. It is very much an overview. And if you are seeing complex behaviors involving fear, anxiety, and aggression, my recommendation is always to seek out the help of a professional um, certified dog trainer or behavior consultant. And um, if you're ever uh, concerned uh, about, you know, who you should be working with, you can reach out to us. Um, we could help you digitally, or we could help you find someone local to you. Um, so I just wanted to overview that uh, <laughs> to start off with uh, and to say that this is really uh, intended as an educational overview on the topic. Uh, it's by no means a <laughs> thorough investigation. Um, so now we've got that little disclaimer out of the way, let's jump straight in and start talking about what leash reactivity is. So uh, it's a common behavior concern. Um, we see in dogs of all ages and all breeds. Um, often, you know, I see online that certain breeds are likely to be reactive and certain breeds aren't. I can tell you that I have seen leash reactive pugs, leash reactive shih tzus. I've seen leash reactive border collies, leash reactive rottweilers, really any breed and of all age. Um, <clears throat> we usually recommend, uh, describe leash reactivity as an overreaction to things frequently experienced on walks. And there are other forms of reactivity like sound reactivity, et cetera, et cetera. We're mostly going to be talking about behaviors that are displayed on leash walks, um, not in the home. Uh, so that's just going to be the focus of our webinar today. 
Let's talk about common triggers. So we say an overreaction to things frequently experienced on walks. What are some of these things? So some common triggers of leash reactivity are fast moving objects like bikes, cars, scooters, or skateboards. I just have children here as a, as a, 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 as a category because they are also fast moving. They tend to be loud and unpredictable. Um, as well as you know, children, we get just general human beings. Um, this can be, uh, all humans or it can be only humans doing certain things or wearing certain things or with certain physical characteristics. Um, we also tend to see a common trigger being dogs. Um, this could be, like I said before, all dogs or it could be certain breeds or dogs displaying certain physical characteristics like maybe they have pointy ears, maybe they are very large, um, maybe it's only running dogs. Um, so you can see how it's quite complex and every animal is very different. Uh, other animals also tend to be a common trigger that we deal with at Calm Canine Academy. So squirrels, cats, rats, pigeons, those sorts of things can also be quite challenging for some dogs. And you can see this cute little illustration here <laughs> um, of a very common occurrence um, in the urban environment, which is one dog barking and lunging at another dog. So we're seeing an overreaction to these things um, quite um, typically. Uh, what is that overreaction? There are some common behaviors associated with leash reactivity. Um, and we can kind of go down the list and it's, you can start, you start at something quite simple, like just fixating, freezing, staring, and it can escalate to pulling, lunging, and then we might see whining, barking, growling, snapping, uh, for example. Um, this is kind of a, a, a ladder, I guess, of escalating behaviors. Um, and often the behavior is dependent on the intensity and proximity of the trigger. Um, yeah, so these are the kind of the common behaviors that we see associated with the different triggers. And um, uh, you could see any variety of these uh, depending on the severity of the trigger. So those are the main big ones, right? These are the big ones that people, these here are the big ones that people come to us. We're really concerned about, you know, my dog's not walking, they're freezing, oh, they're barking at every dog they see, for example. But there are also a lot of lesser known indicators of leash reactivity that the professional will look for when um, assessing a dog that is struggling with this behavior concern. I've bolded some of the ones that I think are particularly important. Um, Hypervigilance in an environment, meaning that they may be scanning the environment on the lookout for their trigger. We might see decreased eating, um, maybe the dog that really likes snacks in the house but really won't take any food out of the house. Um, sometimes we see dogs redirecting and mouthing on the leash. This is a common uh, concern that guardians bring to me uh, and uh, after learning a little bit more we learn that the dog's actually a little bit reactive and nervous. Um, we might see difficulty focusing, pulling, jumping, hyperactivity, excessive scavenging and then this one I think is a, quite a good one as well, avoidant behaviors when seeing walking equipment so you bring out that leash and harness and the dog runs and hides maybe. Uh, I don't want to go out, essentially, is what they're saying. Um, so these are some things uh, that we might look for in addition to the big, loud behaviors that we see on leash. And if you're looking at this um, list and you're saying, oh, yes, tick, 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 tick. I've seen a few of these. Fantastic. That's very observant. Um, if you haven't, look out for them because you might notice um, your dogs licking their lips or yawning a lot, or maybe they get a little hyperactive on the way outside and you might be able to say, oh, okay, fantastic. I can identify this as one of the lesser known indicators of leash reactivity. So those are the things that we're going to be looking for. I do think it's important to think here, like I defined this behavior concern as an overreaction to things frequently experienced on walks. I think it's important to just discuss very quickly what constitutes an overreaction because in some cases, freezing, staring, lunging, barking, even snapping are quite reasonable. Um, and this is an example of a reasonable reaction. Say you have your dog um, that's on leash and walking in the park and another dog runs up to them and starts barking and jumping on them. Uh, your dog can't run away because it's on leash. Maybe they lunge and bark saying, get away from me, just like you can see here on the left. Um, this golden retriever is saying, bugger off you. I don't want to interact with you right now. Um, to me, uh, that is a very reasonable reaction, um, particularly if the aggressing dog in this instance had given a few other indicators of discomfort prior to the lunging and barking. 
An unreasonable reaction would be, say, there is another dog or a person walking on the other side of the sidewalk, uh, finding their own business, and your dog is straining and barking at the end of the leash um, at them. So I think it's important to remember that, you know, freezing, staring, lung, lunging, barking, they are, uh, they're, they have functions um, and sometimes it's reasonable <laughs> to, to use those behaviors um, to get distance. And I think that, you know, in some cases, you know, being reached for and jumped on while on leash, um, it can be classified as reasonable. So I do sometimes have guardians come to me saying, oh, my my Fido, whenever the dogs try and play with him in the dog park, he, he barks at them. And I find out that that dog is on a short leash and it's being jumped on by a bunch of other dogs. And I'm like, actually, that's quite a reasonable reaction. <laughs> um, so I think it's important to um, to just like clarify that really quickly. All right, so we're seeing all of these behaviors. We're seeing lunging, barking, maybe snapping. We're seeing um, fixating. Why? <laughs> Why are they performing these behaviors? And, and this is a question I get so frequently um, from guardians. Uh, and I think uh, we can start off by saying there is usually an underlying emotional component. Um, I think this really depends on dog to dog, um, but in general, we see some combination of fear, anxiety, or frustration um, as the underlying component and the kind of motivating factor behind a lot of these behaviors. Um, in the majority of the cases, these dogs are either feeling fearful um, and uncertain about the stimulus and the lunging and barking behavior is intended to increase distance between them and their trigger. So they're saying, buff, 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 I'm very big and scary. And the trigger passes them by and they say, phew, that was a close one. Gah, good thing I lunged and barked, <laughs> right? So we might see fear and anxiety as an underlying um, uh, emotional contributing factor. We might see hyper arousal and frustration. Uh, so these are dogs that would be maybe friendly in an off leash setting, maybe really want to play, really want to greet the pe greet people or dogs, really want to run around and have fun. But because they're confined on leash, they're experiencing a large amount of frustration, um, which is kind of uh, coming across as these lunging and barking behaviors. Now, you know, we can never really we can't ask the dogs how they're feeling. So we are always guessing to a certain degree. Um, and I try not to attribute too many um, emotions to animals that can't verify it. Um, but I think it's an important thing to bear in mind here because it's gonna affect how we treat them. Um, and it's very important to understand that these dogs are definitely not just being bad or naughty. Um, they usually have a very significant um, feeling underlying that. And when you look at some of the lesser known behavioral indicators, you see a lot of physical things like dilated pupils, increased heart rate, rapid respiration. This is a real event that takes place in the dog's physiological body. Uh, and the response is because of um, a, a true uh, emotional response to the trigger. And I think that's really important to get very clear about. Um, for some dogs, there's like a possible genetic component as well. So Genghis the Corgi, you see in this, pic in this picture on the left, he's a herding breed. And he was very taken by fast moving objects and uh, no doubt there was a genetic component. Uh, I also do think he had some uh, feelings of, of anxiety and fear, but uh, we definitely do see that there are some breeds um, that uh, because they have been genetically selected to be very um, sensitive to fast moving stimuli, or bred to literally chase and nip at fast moving stimuli like a herder, um, we might see uh, that being a contributing factor. And for many dogs, being confined on leash in the hectic urban environment is a compounding factor. And I mentioned this briefly earlier, but the leash will remove the dog's ability to move away from triggers. And when the flight option is taken away, we tend to see them either choosing to freeze, well, not choosing, we see them defaulting to freeze. So the fixating, staring, uh, being unable to move or fight behaviors such as lunging, barking, growling, right? So um, the leash is often a contributing factor the urban environment is often a contributing factor those thin sidewalks that hectic environment it really does um, kind of create a sensory overload for many of the animals that are walking around it every single day i think it's important as well um, to like really focus and push this point that 
And I say, I say this because so many folks come to me and say, you know, they know, they know how to walk on a leash. They know their name, but they just won't listen when they're outside. They just won't, they refuse to. And I always have to make a small shift in language because dogs that perform these behaviors likely are doing so because they don't know what else to do slash they can't do anything else in that moment. Um, for them so far, it's the only thing that's worked and they will continue to perform it to meet their needs, either their needs to increase distance or their needs to just release that frustration, right? Um, it is an involuntary and very natural stress res response that they should not be judged or punished for. And I say this as someone who raised their own reactive dog in New York City and a phrase or maybe a mantra that I used a lot to help me take deep breaths when he was having moments that were embarrassing, frustrating, and scary at times is your dog is not having giving you a hard time, they are having a hard time. Uh, really, really does help to shift the language from um, they need, they're kind of refusing to listen to they cannot listen. Um, yeah, there are so many details that we could go into about leash reactivity. We could talk about the triggers for days. We could discuss so many different factors. I really want to give a relatively brief overview today. Actually, I'm going to go back for a quick second. Um, a relatively quick, brief overview today. Um, I'm going to talk about some things that we sometimes get wrong, but just to overview, as we see um, that this is such an emotion, there's such an emotional component behind these um, these behaviors, it becomes our job to change how our dogs feel around their triggers so that the need to react goes away. We're gonna talk uh, in depth about the behavior training that we do with dogs who are struggling with this um, concern, uh, behavior concern in a bit. Before we go into that, I wanna just go over some common mistakes that I see uh, happening in uh, our clients and our community, but also mistakes that I see um, spread online <laughs> and um, just like you should never google your medical symptoms you should never google your dog behavior problems um, there really are just a host of uh, there's a host of misinformation out there um, and so I want to go over some common tactics that I think are not only ineffective but will likely make it much much worse there are three major ones that I see and I'm going to go into them one by one so the first thing that we definitely don't want to be doing is exposure therapy. Um, they'll just get used to it or they have to get used to it um, is something that I, I hear a lot. Um, and this would usually look like, you know, you get a, a new dog, maybe it's uh, fearful or reactive or performing unwanted behaviors. And we're taking them for long walks every day, many, many walks, trying to get them used to the environment. Now, um, if I had a phobia or a fear, or if I had a stimulus that I couldn't handle, exposing me to it at a level that triggered unwanted behavior over and over again, is actually likely to sensitize me even further. Think about it this way, you have a phobia of spiders and um, we try to get you to feel better about it by kind of throwing spiders at you or making you hold giant tarantulas um, every day. You know, there's a small percentage of the population who would be able to weather such therapy um, and come out going, okay, we, we handled it. But the majority, particularly those who are having at real significant emotional reactions are actually just gonna be sort of mildly, um, for lack of a better word, traumatized by that, um, that sort of therapy, uh, and it will probably make them much more scared in the long run. So if we're seeing a dog that is exper uh, experiencing maladaptive emotional responses on leash walks, the last thing we want to do is kind of put them in the middle of um, the urban environment surrounded by their triggers and uh, expect them to kind of get over it or get used to it. So that's the first thing we definitely don't want to be doing. Um, and the second thing is punishing the dog. They need to know that's not okay, that it's not okay to do that is something that I often hear from folks. You know, how do I tell them that that's not okay? And in most cases, this is coming from a place of love. You know, we, we want the dog to be a happy, healthy member of society. We don't want them to be performing these behaviors that are scary and frustrating um, and ostracizing when you're in a community, you know, to have to um, deal with something like that. So the reality of trying to punish a behavior like that um, is that we are only suppressing the behavior. Uh, a punishment often looks like, you know, 
the dog lunges, maybe someone tries to give a leash correction, meaning that they yank very hard on the leash to cause an unpleasant or painful sensation. The idea is that that unpleasant or painful sensation will minimize uh, the dog's likelihood of performing that behavior again. Now, in some cases, this will work. Um, however, I don't think it's an effective strategy since it doesn't actually address the underlying emotional issues, right? It doesn't actually teach the dog anything other than what they shouldn't do. What it fails to do is show the dog what it should do. And in many cases, we create a sort of ticking time bomb whereby the dog is afraid um, or overwhelmed, but not expressing it. Uh, and a trainer that I... Um, a friend of mine says it's like turning the fire alarm off in a burning building and I can't think of a more apt description. Um, dogs that are punished for their maladaptive behaviors learn to suppress their feelings um, and for some dogs uh, this can be very dangerous and can create this uh, kind of quote-unquote ticking time bomb of stress and fear and um, it's not unusual to see dogs who are trained in this method one day snap um, and uh, perform more extreme versions of the behavior at a uh, kind of moment's notice. So we really don't want to be punishing the dog and studies show that if we apply aggression um, to these sorts of behavior concerns, what we actually create is increased aggression in the animal. It really is just like with people, um, we need to not be punishing, we need to be teaching them an alternate way to handle their feelings and change the way that they feel about these things right um so we don't want to use exposure therapy we don't want to punish them and the last thing we want to avoid is aversive or restrictive equipment um i hear this all the time um from folks oh, i put the head halter on the dog i put the prong collar on or the choke chain on the dog and it's like they're a different dog they're not doing any of the things that they used to do my question is um if it sounds like snake oil, it probably is. <laughs> um, unfortunately, uh, an, a piece of equipment that restricts the animal's ability to express the feelings that they're feeling um, doesn't change how they're feeling about the trigger, right? So we could put a piece of uncomfortable equipment on an animal and they might stop lunging because it hurts, but they're probably still panting. They're probably still showing physical signs of extreme stress. And again, if every time they see a dog, they feel that choke or that pressure on their head uh, when they uh, kind of get stressed, they're likely to actually behave, uh, feel even worse about that stimulus in the future. As well as this, the minute you take that equipment off, the behaviors usually return. So you can see that it's not actually changing behavior, it is just suppressing behavior. And that is really um, a problem uh, for me because uh, from an ethical standpoint, uh, we need to do better than simply um, subduing animals to doing what we want. We need to actually perform therapy to make them feel better. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So don't worry if you've tried any of these methods. Um, we've all, uh, you know, done things before we knew better. Uh, I myself have even tried exposure therapy when I thought it was the way to work with these behavior concerns. But when we learn from our scientific studies, um, we change and we start to uh, kind of utilize the most up-to-date practices. And that's what I want to talk and spend the majority of today talking about with you guys. Um, <clears throat> Before I go on, I am gonna pause for a quick second and just make sure that nobody has any questions because sometimes I do like to jump in and make sure that everyone's feeling good. Pop it in the group chat if you do and I'll try my best to answer them. Um, but um, yeah, I wanna talk about the training plan next. Um, this is a training plan that we go over We've gone over with hundreds and hundreds of dogs um, at Calm Canine Academy. Um, <clears throat> it's a training plan so well trodden that we've actually created a group class um, called Feisty Fido that kind of goes through this plan. Um, and we've literally now seen probably hundreds, if not thousands of dogs um, through. It's an incredibly effective plan. And I'm, we're going to talk about it in a minute. I just want to have a look at the chat very quickly. Ah, yes, great. Um, so the question here is, is it wrong to use a transitional leash as a short term tool in conjunction with R plus methods, or is that still not recommended? Great question. Um, so a transitional leash is a head halter. Um, so it's a piece of equipment that goes over the dog's nose and around their neck. It basically makes it harder for them to perform unwanted behaviors. Um, 
it can be helpful if you have an extremely large dog and a very small handler, um, or if you're in an environment where it's dangerous to have any other piece of equipment on them. But I will never put a dog just on a head halter. I have them on a halter and then also on a harness, because if they do lunge, I don't want to catch them on their neck. It, like, it can, it's shown to be uh, an easy way to cause injury. Um, so if I do need to use a head halter, and I would only use it in very specific cases, such as a dog that's over for 100 pounds and a guardian that's under 100 pounds um, uh, in an environment where I'm concerned about safety. Personally, I think that if we if we can avoid it, if it's not going to be a safety risk, I would not use a head holder because again, it just suppresses those behaviors. And once you suppress the behaviors, it can actually make the actual the anxiety and fear worse in the long run. So I would always avoid using a head holder as a way to suppress behavior, even if that means that they're going to be lunging a little bit more or you know, if they're on a harness, um, they might be performing more unwanted behaviors. That's okay because ultimately it's not going to be taking you steps backwards to your ultimate goal, which is that they're not feeling stressed. So they don't need to use um, the head halter at all. Um, I often find, um, yeah, I, and, and if I do use something like a head halter, I will um, use it not to go on long walks, just to run the dogs out, use the bathroom and then come back in. So personally, um, I want to use the most comfortable um, equipment possible. And for me, that usually looks just like what you can see here. I mean, obviously this is a very tiny little Shih Tzu, um, but I usually will use a, a, a harness, um, a comfortable Y front harness that doesn't restrict shoulder plate movement. Um, I like there to be an attachment point at the front and in between the shoulder blades. And for the very big dogs, I might have two leashes, one attached to the front and one attached to the back. If I were to feel there was a safety risk for the particular dog due to size, for example, um, and I wanted to add extra layers of safety, I might add in a head halter, um, but I will keep an attachment point on the harness. And then lastly, I would add in a muzzle. I'm not going to talk too much about equipment in today's uh, uh, sort of um, webinar other than just this. I, I recommend harnesses. If you are worried about safety, potentially a head halter could get involved in addition to the harness. So we're not catching them on the neck. And in uh, the cases where we're really unsure, uh, a well-conditioned basket muzzle um, to make sure that if we're in, in any close quarters with folks or dogs, that no one's going to get injured. Um, those are really the main pieces of equipment that I would be recommending. Um, yeah, I think that's what I'd, I'd, I'd go for. <clears throat> All right, so I want to go into this treatment plan a little bit more um, and just chat through the four steps that we, we go through. Um, and this webinar has been um, formulated specifically for people who are fostering or adopting um, dogs who are leash reactive. So there's gonna be, we're gonna be talking about the training plan through that lens, imagining that you recently um, uh, sort of became the guardian or caretaker of a dog that is showing leash reactivity. <clears throat> All right, so um, I want to talk about management. Management is so important. I love this picture. This is Genghis again in his little bag. Um, management is so important because we need to avoid exposing the dog to the triggers that um, kind of facilitate the unwanted behaviors. Um, I think it's important to just really stress it's not an obedience issue, right? Um, most leash reactive dogs are brilliant in other contexts, right? I'm sure I've had it so many times. They're perfect and they walk perfectly. They're so good on the leash. <laughs> it's just when we see this trigger, right? Um, it's not about them being disobedient. It's in a serious emotional reaction that we're seeing. Um, it is our job whilst we're working on the other areas of the training plan to shield our dogs from the things that they cannot handle while we work on behavior modification, right? So um, we'll get into the behavior modification, but I cannot express how important this management piece is. If we have dogs that are lunging and barking 10 times plus a day, think about it like money going into the maladaptive behavior bank account. Those dogs are learning, this is how I meet my needs. Uh, we need to perform uh, sort of enact interventions that are gonna minimize their ability to rehearse that unwanted behavior. Some common management ideas that we use in the urban environment include minimizing urban walks to potty walks. In my opinion, when any dog comes straight into New York City, I am pretty much immediately recommending that we minimize walks um, because New York is 
crazy, uh, not just New York, you know, there are lots of urban environments that we work in, um, such as, you know, uh, uh, places in uh, Shanghai, um, Dubai, London, um, other major European cities, other American cities, that can be very overwhelming. Um, and for a dog, especially a recent foster who's just come into the environment, the urban environment, or a recent adoptee who's just developing that bond with the human beings who are its caretakers, we really want to be minimizing how much we're exposing them to stimulus that could be potentially stressful for them, right? Um, so what that usually means for me is that we minimize walks in the urban environment. We just run them outside, do a quick potty, and then run back inside again. Uh, so if we are going to be using uh, an equip piece of equipment like a head halter, it's not going to be used to take them on long walks. It's a quick in and out situation um, where we're trying our best to dodge and minimize triggers uh, from uh, triggering the animal. Um, for some dogs, we can give them an inside potty spot, or maybe you have a yard or a balance balcony that they can use. And in some cases, like Genghis, uh, we might be able to carry the dog in a bag uh, when we're going uh, around uh, town so that they're not sort of feeling so exposed on the floor and having to kind of fend for themselves down there. If you live in, um, and I know we have a lot of folks joining us today from New York, um, if you live in an apartment building or an apartment complex, um, taking your dog down the service elevator or down the um, staircase can be better than the elevator, the sort of main elevators, which often um, can be a point of contention, you know, the, the sort of ding and then they open and suddenly the trigger is right there and you're stuck. Um, so little things like this can make a really big difference in minimizing the amount of maladaptive reactions we're having per day. There are many other management ideas that we, we could go through today, you know, um, some of which involve taking, you know, bits of tasty chicken and steak on every walk and just dropping a kind of trail of treats for the dog to follow so they're not focused on the triggers in the environment. There really are so many, um, but fundamentally we want to be thinking, how do we keep them safe? How do we keep them feeling safe and shield them from the things that they cannot yet handle? I often get a question when I talk about management like this and people often say, hey, Krishna, if we're just avoiding the problem, they're never going to get better. And I have a few uh, Instagram and TikToks that show some management techniques that I use. And I get lots of comments saying, you know, that's not going to change the dog's behavior. And no, it's not. It's not going to change the dog's behavior. Um, but it's not avoiding the problem. It's managing an anxiety condition. Um, if you are fearful of water, you're not going to be going swimming every day. You're you're going to be avoiding those swimming pools until you feel safe enough to get in and that's the exact same thing here lots of folks think oh god but if we're not taking them on walks if we're shielding them like this are we not bad dog guardians you know we're not giving them what they need we're not giving them exercise for the majority of dogs walks in an urban environment one is not sufficient exercise in, in any way <laughs> um, and two and this is a phrase that kind of rings in my head a lot because I feel the same way. <laughs> For reactive dogs, walks are more tiring, uh, are more taxing than tiring. That's meant to be the other way around. You'll see my dyslexia come out here. I'll change that before I send it out to you guys. Um, but for reactive dogs, much like for myself, walks in the hectic urban environment do not feel good. I don't end a walk in central London or central Manhattan and go, ah, oh, what a lovely calming walk that is in the same way I do when I come back from the beach. Um, I often come back a little bit grumpy, a little bit frustrated, I'm often a little bit too warm. Um, so for lots of reactive dogs walks in the urban environment are not taxing at all they're not tiring at all they're actually taxing meaning that they cause more stress than they relieve um, and and for that reason we really do need to be minimizing how much we're putting them in that position um, the last thing for, my, for management here that i haven't got up on the on my slide but um is very important um, from a safety perspective is muzzle training. And I, I've discussed it briefly bef before. Um, if we are at all concerned about a dog being a bite risk, um, not only do we are we sort of ethically required to reach out to a certified behavior consultant, but it's also going to be our responsibility to teach the dog to wear um, safety equipment like a muzzle. Um, this can also help keep uh, potential triggers at a distance. Um, you're much less likely to be approached uh, by people or dogs. If your dog is wearing a muzzle, we call them their party hats. Um, if anyone needs muzzle training recommendations, you can look at the Calm Canine Academy Instagram. We have uh, multiple uh, IGTV videos uh, teaching you how to muzzle train your dog. 
uh, ethically and giving you uh, recommendations for muzzles. So do check us out on Instagram if you want to have a little look at that more. Okay, so this is the first pillar of our training plan, arguably the most important. If we do not get a proper management plan in place, it'll be like taking two steps forward and then three steps back. Uh, so if uh, you do anything for your dog that's reactive, it'll be this. Um, it'll be an act a management plan that minimizes them uh, from being uh, constantly pushed into that state of stress. Um, this will minimize them rehearsing the behavior. It will also uh, ensure they don't enter a chronic stress state. Uh, whereby their body is kind of stuck in a loop of reactivity and anxiety. Um, let me know if you guys have any questions about management here. I know it can be a challenge. And the biggest thing that I say to guardians, in, particularly in places like Manhattan and New York, is you might not get 100% success rate. You know, you might not be able to get those reactions down to zero. But if you had 10 reactions a day and you go down to one, that is fantastic. You're doing an amazing job. Um, but just bear in mind that sometimes we can't have a watertight system because it's just too difficult to manage the environment. But we can, we can just do our best, right? So we're going to do our best to manage the environment. I give you permission to not walk them. I give you permission to carry them. And uh, if you need to speak to the, the building manager to take them down the service elevator, that's fantastic. Uh, and you will be helping them uh, significantly. Um, oh, yes, thank you. What a good tip. I didn't even say that one. Very early morning walks are a management uh, tool, too, that you learned in, the, in one of our online classes. Thank you. Um, and this way, your dog gets at least one long, sniffy, relatively stress-free walk a day. I love that. Thank you for reminding me about that, because it totally is such a great management tool. And there's a great uh, book out there called the, the Midnight Dog Walkers Club, which is all about um, living and working with reactive dogs. And, um, you know, as you can, you can imagine, the Midnight Dog Walkers, these are folks that are taking their dogs out in the middle of the night so that they can have just that but an early morning walk works just as well so thank you for that um, 100% uh, that is exactly one of the management strategies that we use all right so we are managing the behavior condition that's the first step um, what is the second step the second step is to check for underlying medical causes if you have recently adopted or there's a, a foster dog has recently entered your care and you are seeing a reactive reactive behaviors as their advocate, it is your job to ensure that they get a veterinary consultation to make sure that there is uh, no underlying pain, allergies, GI issues that could be impacting this behavior concern. It's also very important if you've had a dog for a few years and they haven't been leash reactive and suddenly they start displaying these behaviors on leash, very important in that case that we go straight to the vet. Um, even if it doesn't look like your dog is in pain or discomfort, that's not really an indicator because most dogs, like most animals, will mask physical pain, will mask physical discomfort. You will be amazed. Um, I've had dogs that um, I have come through my private practice who have been playing an hour of Frisbee a day and then they go to the vet and I re we realize that they have a luxating patella. A dislocation in one of their knee sockets and you would never know but that's because dogs are very good at not expressing not showing their pain uh, so even if it looks like they're absolutely fine it is very very important that we go speak to a veterinarian ideally one who is well versed in behavior um, so i look for fear free certifications uh, for your regular um, veterinary practitioner and you could also look to the American Veterinary Society of Animal Behavior. So these folks are, are very, very um, educated. They have um, degrees in animal medicine and animal behavior. Um, so these really are the creme de la creme if you're looking to double, triple, quadruple check that there's nothing wrong. You're going to be looking for a fear free certified professional or um, a veterinary behaviorist. Um, Whilst you're talking to them and making sure that there are no underlying medical causes, we should also bring up a conversation surrounding anxiety reducing pharmaceuticals. Um, so this would be behavior medication intended to keep um, stress levels low and to generally help the dogs um, moderate their anxiety um, while you work this behavior condition. This is especially important if we're seeing dogs that have multiple triggers, triggers that are very difficult to shield them from, or if they're very sensitive to those triggers, meaning that they're reacting from you know, multiple blocks away, 100 feet away, and really struggling to recover. These are things that really mean we need to be having a, a good conversation with a veterinarian, um, and we have to do it as soon as possible. I think lots of folks um, 
there is a hangover, I think, from uh, you know a, 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 a time when mental health was stigmatized. And I'm hoping that we're working to build a society where that is no longer the case. But for our dogs, it very much still is. Um, and whenever I have this conversation, about 50% of guardians will kind of make the face, um, <laughs> the face that tells you that they're kind of uncomfortable with this. And it's my job to tell you guys that there's nothing to be uncomfortable about this. Just like if you had you know, an infection, you'd go to the doctor, you'd get medication. It's the exact same thing. Um, these anxiety reducing pharmaceuticals are gonna increase neuroplasticity in the brain it's going to make it easier for our dogs to learn a new way to react um, and it's also going to ensure that they don't enter chronic stress states this is all the more important for foster dogs because these foster dogs are in an environment that they're not going to be staying in it's an, essentially an unstable environment they're going to be moved again possibly multiple times that is extremely distressing for an animal um, and very very important um, to me that i am here as that an advocate for behavior medication um, and if we see foster dogs coming into the city um, and they're expressing significant anxiety fear frustration on leash uh, and they're going to be having to endure multiple upheavals um, and you know bonding with a whole new group of people uh, when they're adopted um, this is definitely something to be thinking about um, very seriously um, Oh, good question. So I got a question here from Jeremy about CBD. So what about CBD? And I would categorize CBD under um, like a holistic or um, uh, like non-prescription um, anxiety reducers. There are many different um, non-prescription anxiety reducers, natural stress reducers, we could call them. Um, what it essentially means is that they don't need to be, you don't need a prescription in order to get these, um, these medications. There are others um, that, frequently are used such as dog appeasing pheromones, soliquin, L-theanine, lots and lots of different ones are available and on the market. Now, some of these can help and there are some studies showing that some of these can be effective. Um, and some people have great um, re results with them. Uh, the way that I see it is they're usually more expensive and they have less Back, scientific backing. <laughs> um, and I think that we often have as human beings this um, bias towards the quote unquote natural over the quote unquote pharmaceutical. Remember that really these are the same things. These are, these are labels that we have given these medications. Um, and for me, things like CBD and the natural quote unquote natural stress reducers are probably likely to be less effective, more expensive and less proven to work. In addition, they're less regulated. So if I go to the, uh, a veterinary behaviorist or a vet and they prescribe me medication, I know that it's exactly the right dose for my dog. I know that every single pill is gonna have the same amount of the active ingredients in it. That is not the case for the majority of natural, quote unquote, natural stress reducers. Um, so I often ask folks like, what is it about the natural stress reducers that make it more appealing? And usually it is a cultural bias of some sort. You know, I feel like that's better. Whereas, in fact, when we look at the, the, the kind of the science, the pharmaceuticals are safer, better regulated. We have hundreds of studies backing up their, um, how effective they are. Um, and I'm really part of the group of um, kind of modern behavior professionals that are uh, trying to dismantle this bias around medication um, for every animal. <laughs> um, so again, I'm not um, against natural stress reducers. Um, I'm perfectly, uh, I think, experiment, but make sure that you do so under your vet's um, sort of ad advice as well, because, uh, you know, experimenting with these things, particularly if they haven't been um, sort of approved by FDA approved or studied uh, in, in depth can also be a little bit of a uh, tricky terrain. So just watch yourselves there. But I'm I think that whatever you can do to re relieve their stress is going to be um, is going to be good. Uh, so yeah, definitely experiment if you want to. Um, but regardless, we will be needing to speak to a veterinarian. Um, all right, fab. So we've managed the behavior. We're minimizing their reactions. We've spoken to a veterinarian. They've said, hey, look, there's no pain. Uh, maybe we've got medication. Maybe we haven't. Maybe we're trying natural stress reducers. Whatever they've decided, it's the vet's job to, to that's their area of expertise. Um, the next step is enrichment. See how much stuff we do before we even start training. <laughs> There's so many pieces to the puzzle, so much more than trying to teach our dogs stuff. We have to set a foundation and that foundation is really holistic. Um, so with management and with um, the veterinary consultation, we're ensuring that we set them up for success. 
Enrichment is very important as well because for the majority of our reactive dogs, we're going to be minimizing walks, right? So with the reactive dogs, we are always balancing meeting their needs and minimizing their exposure to the trigger. So I, I have a client who's in our Feisty Fido class. Um, I saw them today and it was their first class and they were really stressed because they were not able to walk their dog. They were in a very small house, a very small apartment, and uh, the dog was um, really bouncing off the walls. And what that was uh, showing is that the management strategies um, were putting the dog in a position where their needs for stimulation, enrichment was not being met. Um, and we need to get creative sometimes in order to meet our dog's species specific needs indoors. And I can tell you, it can be done. I lived in the dinkiest little studio apartment in Brooklyn uh, with my poodle, um, who is a very athletic um, and high drive dog. And uh, usually I recommend a combination of indoor enrichment and decompression walks. So this little picture on the left is an example of indoor enrichment. It's called the eye dig. It's a, uh, a cute little toy that you can get, which kind of stimulates, simulates digging a hole. You can hide food in it and that you can see um, Hayes here, big 70 pound hound who was also quite fearful in the urban environment, getting his dinner out of it. I want to show you guys some examples of enrichment that I think are really helpful. The first one is food enrichment. I'm sure you guys have seen something like this before online. Basically, we're going to be using, um, whether it's toys or trash or whatever, um, to allow our dogs opportunities to perform natural canine behaviors like digging, sniffing, searching. Um, you'll be amazed that 20 minutes or 30 minutes of brain work can be just as effective as sort of intense cardio exercise for our dogs. In many cases, you know, your dogs could run for eight hours a day and they wouldn't even miss a beat. Um, you know, a, a walk around the block is really not gonna be uh, enough. What will be uh, sort of uh, holistically um, beneficial to them is allowing them opportunities to perform these species specific behaviors, chewing, sniffing, licking, searching, ripping, biting, uh, these sorts of things. Um, I have linked in this slideshow an indoor enrichment PDF from Calm Canine Academy, which gives you guys a bunch of ideas, some purchasable products, some homemade DIY options, as well as indoor games that you can be playing with your dog. Things like scent work, tug, uh, little games where you hide the ball in, around the apartment and have them search for it. These are gonna be able, your art are gonna be able to meet their needs using these techniques. You're just gonna have to put in time. So rather than go on a half an hour walk, we might play half an hour of a game indoors. Um, so it might take a little bit more active planning. You might have to actively seek out exercises that you can give your dogs indoors, um, but it is possible. Um, and through indoor enrichment, we can, you know, we can do a lot to meet a, a large majority of our dogs needs and we can use their daily calories to do this. Um, so I would probably put 100% of a reactive dog's daily calories towards enrichment and training so that we really can make um, the most of that, what they have to, to eat in a day. Um, the second thing that we should be doing if possible with our um, leash reactive dogs is providing them opportunities to decompress. Um, decompression uh, walks are a, um, a phenomenon in the dog work training and dog behavior world. Um, they are very different to your average um, urban walk on a six foot leash. Uh, and for some dogs, it will involve getting in a zip car, an Uber, um, or putting them in a backpack and taking them out into a quieter environment. The idea is that we get long leashes, maybe 30 feet long, 40 feet long, a nice harness, and we give them the opportunity to just explore an environment. So this reactive dog has been taken in a car to a quiet leisure center. They've been walked around the back of the leisure center and they're being allowed to sniff around um, and just meet their need to explore and move through the environment, right? Um, in New York, this can be much more challenging, but I have successfully conducted decompression walks in basketball fields, handball courts, around the back of the Brooklyn Museum in the parking lot. Um, you'll be amazed. Um, and I have many, many clients who will take their dogs in a car once a week and take them on a hike, um, for example, in a quiet area. There is also um, 
I think it's an app called Sniff Spots, um, where you can uh, rent out people's yards, backyards, for example, um, and take your dog there for an opportunity to meet their need to move through nature and move through a new environment. Um, we call these sometimes sniffaris as well. The goal is that the dog is just sniffing, moving freely through the environment. And through a combination of indoor enrichment and play, and maybe a weekly decompression walk, we can usually meet the dog's needs without putting them in situations every day where they are being triggered into reacting. Yes, it is a little bit more effort and we have to change our behavior slightly, but it can be the difference between a successful training plan and an unsuccessful training plan. Mm, what do you suggest for a terrier dog who wants to bite things? Hmm, interesting. Um, I'm interested in hearing what bite things means. Would they be trying to bite their triggers? Um, like people and dogs, if that is the case, we're definitely going to be wanting to muzzle train these dogs, that dog, and um, trying to go into the least stimulating environment as possible. So that might mean that you are taking your pup to in a car, going uh, to you know a, um, a, a natural environment somewhere and letting them sniff around for half an hour um, or something like that. Oh, he wants to play and bite soft things, bless, sweet. Um, I mean, I'm perfectly happy for them to play and bite on soft things if that's what they want to do on their, on their walks, that's totally fine. That would be a natural behavior um, that they're allowed to kind of um, fulfill that need for. I would give them outlets um, as much as possible uh, and just do it supervised. Um, so yeah, there's that definitely allow your terriers and your hunting dogs and your pitties who have a, maybe a propensity to chew and bite. That's something that we definitely want to give them an option to do um, in a safe way. Um, so those are the first three pillars. Those are the foundational holistic interventions that we need to make to set the dog up for success. Management to reduce reactivity, uh, veterinary consultation to ensure that there's no medical um, issues and then enrichment to meet their needs. Only when we have these three pillars in place are we going to be able to enact the most important part, arguably, which is behavior therapy. Um, behavior therapy is what we call training <laughs> when we're dealing with complex emotions because it really training is not an effective term we're not training the dog to sit down stay we are changing how they feel about things this is therapy um, but before we even start that let's just set some expectations um, because I think it's only fair to be really realistic with you guys and as I've worked with many many dogs on this behavior these behavior concerns in some of the most challenging environments like Manhattan I think it's only fair to say that working with um, some reactive dogs not all but some reactive dogs particularly in an urban environment can take months sometimes years to fully resolve um, this is just the truth um, <laughs> unfortunately um, so um, I think that setting some expectations um, here is important because I feel like we see these behaviors and we get very, and we get emotional, right? And we want to change how um, that how they're behaving right now. Um, the reality is that that's not how therapy works for any animal. Um, from my perspective, it is inappropriate to start working um, dogs around their triggers until we have enacted the three previous steps. Um, I'm going to really say that again. It is inappropriate to start actively working dogs around their triggers until we have enacted the previous three steps to manage them to minimize their reactions, check their medical status, and meet their needs. If we start trying to work them around dogs, people, skateboards, before we've done these three previous steps, we are going to be not only spinning our wheels, but we're going to be losing the trust of that animal. We're going to be poisoning the training. We're going to be poisoning the therapy. It's very, very important that we are patient with these animals. They will need time to adjust, particularly fosters and rescue new rescues, new adopted dogs will need time to adjust to the new people that are their caregivers, their new city environment and apartment living before we start throwing them into therapy to address their trauma and triggers. It sounds obvious when we say it out loud, but in many cases, you know, you'll adopt a dog or get a foster dog and you want to resolve the behavior concern because you want them to be, um, you know, have the best, you want them to have the best opportunity to be adopted maybe, or you want to quickly resolve the behavior concern with your adopted dog so that you have the quote unquote, you know, that perfect dog of your dreams. Um, 
but we need to be realistic and we need to be fair on the animals. Um, and many, many times, you know, I have guardians um, coming to me and, you know, they'll say, I adopted my dog, um, you know, two weeks ago uh, and they're leash reactive and I've done seven training sessions with dogs. And I'm like, whoa there, <laughs> hold your horses. Um, I, I love the vigor. <laughs> I love, I love that. Um, and uh, we will definitely see a lot of success with that can do attitude. However, we do need to give them time. Um, for some dogs, you know, we need multiple weeks just working on management, veterinary sort of medical stuff and enrichment before we even start working on uh, working them around their triggers. Um, and most importantly, lots of these dogs, recent rescues, recent foster dogs, don't have a language through which to speak to people yet, right? They have no previous training, no previous learning experience with human beings. So before we start working them around the things that provoke extreme emotional reactions, we often need to just focus on foundational exercises that have nothing to do with their triggers. So don't worry, if you have a reactive dog that you're living or working with right now, and you really want to get started on their therapy, there's stuff you can do. But let's just set the expectation that you're not going to be immediately launching in to working them around their triggers straight away. Um, so for many fosters, and this is often a, a recommendation that I'll give to fosters who um, do sessions with me, um, I will say you really need to be focusing on the management, on the enrichment, and you know, make sure they see a vet. Uh, and we're not gonna, we're not gonna even go near the triggers. We're just gonna teach them a few key skills, and and that's what I'm gonna be uh, talking about first. So just a little expectation setting for you guys. Um, but now we can actually get into the the therapy itself. <gasps> Why is my video not here? One second, my loves. I've got to find it. Give me one moment. I'm gonna pause the recording for a second. All right short uh, intermission there but we're back um let's start talking about the things that we are going to teach our dogs um i say that when we start talking we start talking to our dogs about about their um their feelings uh, we need to do two things we need to set a foundation of communication and defensive skills um what this usually means is a few key exercises that teaches them um, basically the language through which we are going to um, use their therapy, do their therapy. Um, yeah, it's going to be like teaching them a language through which we will be conducting their behavior therapy. Um, this should all be perfected indoors and then taken into slightly more challenging environments. And this can be part of their enrichment program, right? So maybe you're not working them around dogs or people or skateboards, but you can be working on all of these exercises indoors. And I have tutorials for pretty much all of these on the Calm Canine Academy Instagram. Uh, look at the IGTV history and you should find them. Um, we also teach all of these skills in our Feisty Fido group class. So let's have a little look at some of our uh, feisty Fido dogs um, <laughs> performing some of these skills. So the first one that we'll teach is unprompted yes. attention. What this usually means is marking and rewarding yes. dogs for giving us their attention. This is very important for reactive dogs especially. Yes. Let's have a little look at some videos here. Yes. So all you're seeing here is dogs in different environments being marked and reinforced. We're saying yes when they look at us and giving them food. This is teaching dogs to give us their attention, right? This is gonna be so important when we start working them around their triggers. If we don't do this with them, the chance of them giving us their attention is very, very little. So say you've just got a recent rescue, you might wanna start working on just saying yes or good. When they look at you, that is a marker that signifies to the dog that was the correct behavior and you follow it with a treat. Let's see that again. Yes. 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 
we all want to use lots of small chopped up high value treats starting in your apartment and then slowly maybe moving into more distracting environments but we shouldn't be starting around the trigger we do this at first in a less distracting environment so unprompted attention would be number one and you can see we're using this kind of marking and reinforcing um, so that's the first skill that we'll give any dog working with leash reactivity the second would be leash walking exercises and we usually use simple repetitive patterned walking games developed by um, a really phenomenal trainer and mentor of mine, Leslie McDivitt. If anyone wants to look this up, you can look up pattern games for dogs. Um, these are particularly good for reactive dogs as they we use kind of predictable repetitive patterns. This is Rocky. Um, he's one of the dogs in our Feisty Fido class. We'll start indoors and then slowly start to take this outside, teaching our dogs to follow us, to walk you know, in that nice heel, quote unquote heel position um, and teaching them that when we move away from them uh, on leash, they should follow us, right? So you're seeing how these core skills are gonna be very very important um, for dogs uh, who are reactive. We need to teach them to look at us. We need to teach them to walk with us. The majority of recent fosters and rescues have no experience with either of these things. So we often do have to start um, indoors, making it very simple and easy for them, nowhere near their triggers, and then building up um, to, to baby basically being working around their triggers later on in the treatment protocol. Um, so we've got attention, we've got loose leash walking. The next one we're going to uh, kind of focus on with these dogs is uh, leash pressure. Uh, leash pressure basically means teaching the dogs what to do when they hit the end of the leash, because chances are reactive dogs are going to find themselves hitting the end of the leash at least at some points in their lifetime. Uh, and we need to rehearse with them what we want them to do. So let's have a little look at that. Oh, I just should, should just quickly say that by no means are these videos intended as tutorials. So please don't try and go off and do this at home after watching these. Um, I do have tutorials for these, like I said, on Instagram. Um, yeah, so definitely don't kind of go, oh, okay, cool. It's just like, the, and then kind of go, go and try it out. Definitely watch the full tutorials that you'll find on our IGTV page. Um, so leash pressure is the next thing. Uh, what you will see here in this next little clip is me working with a reactive dog, Kaya, in Manhattan, teaching her what to do when she hits the end of the leash. Hopefully this will make sense just by watching it. Basically, um, we use a distraction of some sort. Uh, this is some cheese on the floor here in front of the camera. And I'm teaching her that when she feels tension in her leash, she should come back to me and she will get reinforcement. This is really helpful to rehearse because most reactive dogs are likely at some point to hit the end of the leash. And what we don't want them to do is be stuck there, unsure of what to do next. You can see a young puppy here, another little corgi working yeah, on this. <laughs> and we make it fun, right? We teach them when you feel pressure, you should follow me and come back to me. And then I will give yeah, you a reinforcement. Come, <laughs> it can really reduce frustration. It can really reduce confusion on leash for these dogs to be given um, a chance to rehearse what they should do when they get into these sticky situations. And remember that lots of these dogs, particularly recent fosters and rescues and adopted dogs, have never even been on a leash really before, never had any leash training. Uh, so we often really do have to start at the beginning. There are two more foundational communication exercises. You see how much work we have to do to really get them understanding what we need from them. This doesn't happen overnight, right? Um, the, the, the last two that we use are, one is a game called Find It. Um, this is essentially just a game to teach dogs to put their nose on the floor and sniff. It's very, very simple. We simply just play the cookie toss game where we toss little treats around on the floor in a variety of environments and get them sniffing with their nose down, investigating the environment to find the food. Uh, find it so helpful, especially because um, they're very easy. And sometimes you need to ask a dog to do something very easy when they're in a moment of stress. Uh, and secondly, because sniffing, um, as we see from multiple studies, lowers the heart rate, lowers the blood pressure. When we're dealing with an emotional reaction, we sometimes need to teach them exercises and rehearse exercises that will help them regulate themselves. This is one of my favorites. I have all of my puppies do this. All of the dogs that come through my Feisty Fido class do this. And this is just a nice little example here of um, a dog who is struggling to move away from a dog and we'll see them use their find it's to move away. And all the other dogs have been there. So I've made to, Bubba, find it. 
comes when I find it, because I'm out. Good boy. Come on, find it. Let's go. It'll reduce stress. Yes, find it. It'll oh. reduce frustration. And it's just a great management tool, a great way to kind of help a dog out in a moment in a sticky situation. So you guys can see how all of these tools work together. Um, there is one last uh, exercise here that we do learn, um, and this is particularly useful um, in the urban environment. It's called a U-turn. Uh, a U-turn is a defensive maneuver uh, for the, the reactive dog who's maybe walking down the street and suddenly is faced with a trigger and you need to move in the other direction. You can see one of my private clients, Rory, practicing this with her parents um, to finish up this video. Good boy. Good boy. So we're practicing this emergency U-turn with the verbal cue, Rory, turn, and then she gets a nice jackpot once she turns around. So in future, well, now we're working around dogs, practicing turning away from them um, and moving to safety. <laughs> so um, these exercises that we learn, um, unprompted attention, loose leash walking, leash pressure, find it and U-turns, these are foundational and critical communication exercises that are going to teach your dog and you the language through which we will then um, kind of conduct the therapy around the trigger. Um, most dogs need to work on these for a few weeks before they're able to do this around their trigger. And that is totally normal. So again, part of that expectation setting, there is a foundation that needs to be laid here. Um, so say you have a, a reactive foster dog or a reactive adoptive dog. These, this is the place that you can start. You can work on your management, go to the vet, get an enrichment um, sort of schedule in place and then you can start working from the comfort of your own home on your communication and defensive walking skills. Whew, okay, once you've got that done, only then are we going to start actually working on behavior therapy, on desensitization and counter conditioning. Um, desensitization and counter conditioning basically means that we have to change the dog's emotional reactions to the triggers. Um, we usually will teach them a new behavior. Um, usually it's to look at their handler, but it's very important that the dog needs to be worked at or under threshold. What that means is that they need to be sufficiently far away from their trigger that they're not reacting. They're not lunging, barking. They are able to eat, they're able to play and they're able to engage. Because of this, because of the fact that therapy needs to take place below threshold, a lot of urban, uh, sorry, a lot of behavior therapy can rarely be done on the fly in an urban environment. We often have to um, create setups with the triggering stimuli so the dog can learn how to react differently. Um, you're going to see a few examples of this in the video, um, but in general, and I say this very generally because there are many different methods that we can use to work with reactivity to desensitize and counter condition, but in general, what we will do is teach our dogs through classical conditioning that um, when they see their trigger from a distance, uh, they are going to get something really, really good. I'm thinking here, steak, sausages, uh, pork chops, <laughs> or for my dog Hera, a tennis ball. The best thing that that dog could be given is going to be paired with the uh, triggering stimulus. This will help change their emotional response. We're then gonna use operant conditioning to teach them an alternate behavior, uh, which is often to look at us or to target our hand or something like that um, in order to get their needs met. Um, so classical conditioning to change their, their emotional response. And then we teach them to look at us or um, to walk away from the trigger rather than lunging and barking. Let's have a few look, a look at a few uh, examples here. Um, I have a few uh, chopped together for you guys to look at just to give you guys an idea of what this might look like. Um, again, by no means do I think you can watch this three minute video and then go off and perform your own behavior therapy with your dog, but hopefully it will give you some idea of most importantly, how boring this training is. I don't know if you guys have ever seen some of those sensationalist dog training TV shows 
um, the canine paradigm was one. There's a few, obviously Cesar Milan is a big one that comes to mind. Um, these TV shows that are all drama, um, you know, someone's wrestling a dog down and there are dogs lunging and barking. In reality, that is not what therapy looks like. Just like, um, you know, if you go to a therapist's office, people aren't tearing down the paintings and throwing things. No, they're calmly talking, right? It's exactly the same for our dogs. It should look boring. So I put together a few videos to show you guys. Um, this first one, is my dog Hira, um, and he's working with a stuffed dog um, in the in my yard. I have to apologize for the state of my yard. It is pretty terrible. He just had a bit of a party out there. He did his enrichment out there just prior to us filming this video. What you will see is um, a, a stuffed dog, a demo, like a, literally a, a, a toy dog in the yard. This could be a real dog. It could be a person. It could be a bicycle. It could be whatever the trigger is. And I'm marking and reinforcing him for looking at the trigger calmly. So let's have a little look at this. There's the stuffed dog. Yes. Every time he looks over at that dog, yes, he's going to get a yes and a treat. He is learning that big scary black dog equals treats. Yes. How's the dog? Yes. Sometimes I'll put this on cue and teach the dog yes. to point it out to me. Yes. Good. Where's that dog? Yes. So we gain a good boy, basically. Hera. Where is it? Where's the dog? Yes. And you see that marker, yes, the second that so, they see the trigger or inside. observe the trigger. Boy. We have another example here. This is a little dog called Ellie. Uh, she's a little bit nervous of people. And in this video, her trainer is introducing her to the person behind the camera. So what you'll see is every time Ellie looks at the cameraman, they're gonna say yes and put a treat on the floor for her. This is building positive associations with the new person. Her. You might even notice her eyes are quite wide and she furrows her brows when she looks at this person who's holding the camera. Every time she looks at the scary person, she gets a yes and a treat. I have a few more examples, but I just want to check the chat really quickly. Great question. What if my dog is not scared of dogs, but rather very excited? This is such a great question. And I'm gonna pause actually in my video watching to address it. So what this is referring to is that there can be multiple different, um, there can be different emotions underneath reactive behaviors. Um, what we'd usually say in very nerdy dog training terminology is that there can be a positive valence or a negative valence. A negative valence would be a dog like this dog we're gonna watch now, who is very fearful of new people walking around her home. Um, that's the negative valence. Usually the, the labels will give the, the emotions would be fear, anxiety, uh, frustration, for example. On the other end of the scale, we have a positive valence. These are dogs that are extremely excited, extremely happy, very physically activated when they see people. Um, in reality, no matter whether you have a positive or a negative valence, the treatment plan is the same. You will still be using the, this kind of counter conditioning technique, whereby every time they look at the person, they get a reinforcer. The difference is, is that for dogs that have a negative valence, they will end up moving away from the trigger. And dogs with a positive valence, their reward will be moving towards the trigger and maybe going to say hi at the end of their little training session, if that makes sense. So regardless of what the valence is or what the underlying emotion is, we use the same treatment plan because essentially we need to do the same thing. We need to manage them. You probably don't need to go to a veterinarian though. That's the only difference. <laughs> you'll still need to do enrichment and you'll still need to do this behavior therapy, both the communication skills and the desensitization and counter conditioning. And it will work regardless of what the, un the maladaptive emotional response is. So 
Such a good question there. Um, and, and, and yeah, really, really great one. And let's look at Willa here. This is Willa, she's a Weimariner. Um, and in this little video, she's very uncomfortable with people walking around her home. Um, so you'll see in this video, trainer Nicole Vento is um, marking and reinforcing every time she looks at me, I'm holding the camera. Every time Willa sees me and looks at me, she gets a mark. In this case, we're using a clip but you can just say yes, and then treat him. I've got a few more examples. I just put all of my examples in here, really. Um, I thought, why not? This is Odin, um, and we're using the same technique as a dog crosses the street across the road for him. Odin was a Muddy Paws rescue. He was originally called Bob, um, and he had some uh, reactivity towards dogs. Again, he had a positive valence as well. He wanted to go and say hi to the dogs, and that would look like lunging. You'll see a dog come into the frame here. Every time he looks at that dog, I'm marking yes and feeding him, so he's learning to look without lunging. I have a few more examples. I just think they're so cute. This little chihuahua um, is, uh, again, mar being marked. Oh, what happened? Excuse me. Where's my chihuahua gone? I'm not sure if you're going to be able to hear the mark in this next video, but this little chihuahua, Ziggy, is getting a yes and a treat whenever they look at a dog that's walking by over there. Yes, and a treat. So you're seeing how in all these different contexts with lots of different triggers, we can start building these positive associations. Here's an example with a bike. Every time the dog looks at the bike, he gets marked and reinforced. We are from a distance where he is not barking and lunging. He is able to kind of relax with me and chill out. When the bike is gone, oh no, no more snacks. But in a second, the bike is gonna enter the environment again and the yes and treats are gonna start again. So you can really see how um, we can change a dog's emotional response through this, this associative learning. There you go, click and treat, click and treat. I have one, I think one or two more examples here for you guys. Yes. So we're yes when he looks over at that black dog by the trash can. Yes. And again, and what we end up with, once we start marking and reinforcing dogs frequently for looking at the trigger, is a dog that will look back at us. Yes. Like that. Yes. This would be almost impossible for this dog a few weeks before, before or a few months before. Oh, so good. Yes. I think that's the end, that's the last one there. Um, okay, so what I was kind of looking for in that little video is to show you guys um, that we teach our dogs uh, these foundational exercises, um, the unprompted attention, the pattern walking, the leash pressure, uh, the find it and the U-turn. These are ways that we can communicate with them. You know, we can walk them. Uh, they know what to do. They know to look at us. They know to follow us. We can regulate their emotions with find it and we can get them out of a sticky situation with a U-turn. And then we can start working on teaching them to calmly observe their triggers from a distance. Um, once they're able to observe them from a distance, we slowly bring them closer and closer. But this does have to be systematic in order to set them up for success. I see a few questions. I said I wasn't going to take questions but I can't help it. I like it now. Oh, I got a direct message from one of my trainers saying that there was a bit of a lag on the videos. I apologize about that. Um, the marking might have been a little bit off for you guys. Um, so what you were meant to see there is when the dog looked at the trigger, that's when the mark happened. Um, so it's when their eyes hit the trigger, yes, and treat. Thank you, Ingrid, for letting me know that. Um, uh, yeah, so you guys can always re-watch these videos if you want to. As I said, the slides are going to be available for everyone on YouTube as well as um, the participants in the live webinar. Um, I got a question here. This one is a kind of a side one, but why not? My dog doesn't pull, but he likes walking behind me. Isn't that normal? I think perfectly normal. Um, many dogs don't love walking right at the human side. Um, uh, lots of dogs like to walk a little bit ahead or a little bit behind. And I'm actually really okay with that. I don't, I think it's kind of very old fashioned to insist that a dog walks in the perfect heel position. Um, you know, they're, they're animals, they're sentient beings. <laughs> um, maybe they're going to walk a little bit ahead, a little bit behind, as long as they're not pulling, 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 pulling. I'm really okay with that. Um, so anyway, if the, if the videos were a little bit off, do go back and check it out again. Um, but generally, I want you to take away that um, 
there are so many different components to working with this behavior concern and we're playing a long game a long game that requires a lot of foundation setting and a holistic approach. Um, it's not really um, as simple as it might look. Sometimes we don't just kind of take them around the triggers and, um, you know, just uh, feed them treats until they're fine. There is definitely an art and a science to it. Um, and I would highly recommend doing this with the help of a trainer. Um, although there are lots of free resources available, especially on our Instagram. So you guys can check that out. Um, all right, I'm coming to the end. We're finishing up. Um, I know you guys have been here for ages, so thank you so, so much for listening so beautifully. I want to give you guys a little bit of um, uh, some resources to move forward with. Um, if you guys are interested in um, learning how to do this and how to work your, with your dog on their reactivity, um, we have two options at CCA. We have Feisty Fido, a digital group class. It's six weeks. Um, you can access it anywhere in the world, and we will take you through um, the process to train all of these behaviors and more. Uh, and then we'll help you, um, you know, get your dog in setups uh, and see success and, and see uh, behavior change. If you would want to work a little bit more intensely, you can work privately with one of our trainers who specialize in leash reactivity in an urban environment. Uh, and I have links to both of those services here for anyone who's interested. But fundamentally, you know, I really just wanted to thank everyone for being here and give you guys access here in this link to our Instagram where we have loads of free tutorials um, about how to teach all of the communication and defensive walking exercises as well as lots of resources for reactive dogs. I'm going to pop my video on for a second to say hi to everyone. Hello. <laughs> Thank you for hanging out for so long. You've all been fantastic and you've asked, asked some really wonderful questions. Um, if anyone has any additional questions, feel free to reach out to us on Instagram um, or you can um, hit us up uh, on uh, an e info at calmcanineacademy.com. Both of those are great places to look, uh, look for more information. Thank you guys so much. Oh, thank you, you're all so sweet. I had a lovely time. Um, it was really lovely um, being around and, and answering all of your questions. You gave really great questions. So that was so helpful for me. Um, and like I said, um, tons of free resources available. Uh, and if you need any extra help, you just hit us up, all right? And we're here to help. Um, all right, my loves, you're all fantastic. Your dogs are very lucky to have you. I'll let you go and get on with your day, um, but hopefully we've all learned something and um, we're, our dog's gonna be a little better off um, at, after the, off the back of this. Um, thank you so much. Um, have a good one and give all your dogs a big kiss from me. Okay, bye, have a good day. Thank you. <laughs>